ready for a confession from your pastor? Anybody? Yeah, okay, cool. So, I want to tell you very honestly, I know Jesus, I love Jesus, I follow Jesus, but yet I still, I, I battle, I really, I, I battle with, with feelings of anxiety. I really do, and I wish that wasn't the case. And I don't know how anxiety has affected your, your relationship with anxiety in, in this season of life, but I can tell you that I find myself oftentimes with just this massive weight on my chest, right? The weight of, of the workload on my mind, and a lot of times it, it just locks in, like in the middle of the night, just on the responsibilities and all the things that I have to do, and I find myself just fighting to just catch my breath and just calm myself down, to just calm my spirit, because sometimes I just get overcome with a, a very real sense of, of anxiety. And again, I, I know Jesus, I love Jesus, I follow Jesus, but I'll tell you, even as a pastor, I battle with very real anxiety. And, and chances are that some of you in here with this number can relate, and maybe more now than ever, because we face challenges in this life every single day that cause us to have anxiety. And when we look at the world out there, it's no wonder that we have these feelings, because everywhere you look, there is sickness, there's violence, there's uncertainty, and the pressure to succeed in school, the pressure of sports, the pressure to be that perfect child that you think your parents expect you to be. It's no wonder that we feel anxious. It's no wonder that we feel lonely and unsettled, and we're left searching for something that feels normal, something that feels calm and, and peaceful. And it can happen really quickly, too. You can be fine one day, think, man, anxiety is not something I deal with, and then it's just like out of nowhere. And there's a statistic that, that kind of shows this, and granted, this one has some extreme circumstances, but it's from the National Center of Health, right? And it shows what, how many people battle with anxiety, and so you're not alone. And it shows how quickly life can come at us. And so in July of 2019, 8.2, only 8.2% of people showed signs of anxiety. But only a year later in July of 2020, granted we know what that year held, but it went all the way up to 36% of people that were showing signs of anxiety. And so what we see is life can come at us quick. And in this series called Emotions, we're looking at some of the emotions that Jesus endured that he expressed in tonight. I want us to look at anxiety, and I want to start by just acknowledging that anxiety is a very, very complicated thing. Anxiety can be physiological, can be emotional, can be situational, and it can even be spiritual. And so when we talk about anxiety, what I want to do is to take a, a holistic approach, meaning that if you struggle with anxiety, then, then you may want to see a doctor who can help and, and talk about you know your diet, supplements, that kind of thing, medication, because that stuff can be very, very helpful. You may want to see a counselor to talk about your anxiety, and we want to take a holistic approach in this because the only area that I'm qualified to talk about is, is spiritual anxiety. And so as we take this approach, I'm going to speak from a spiritual perspective into a very real emotion that so many of us endure today. And so with that, we're going to look at how Jesus dealt with anxiety, because believe it or not, he did. But as Christians, those of us that call ourselves Christians, we think, you know, when we get to talking about anxiety, we talk about anger, it raises these questions, right? If I, if I feel anxious, did I fail God? Is he mad at me for feeling anxious? Am I letting him down? Am I not living by faith if I feel anxious? Is it a sin to be anxious? Well, I want to say again very clearly, like we did last week with anger, it is not a sin to be anxious. In fact, it's a little bit like that anger that we talked about last week. Anger in and of itself is not a sin, but it can lead to sin very quickly and very easily. And the same is true with anxiety. The Bible says, in your anger, do not sin. And so just like anger, anxiety can often and, and will lead to sin. 
But feeling anxious in a moment doesn't mean that you've let God down. And again, when you look at Jesus, the perfect son of God, and you look at what he endured, many people would agree that Jesus had anxiety. As he realized, right, this, this moment when he realized he would have to endure this suffering, right, the cross that was before him, right, the price that he would pay as he would give his life for us. In fact, what I want to do tonight is to look very specifically at how Jesus responded to the anxiety that he felt in his life, how Jesus responds to this, this overwhelming sense of anxiety. And what's interesting is whenever Jesus felt anxious, you know what he did? He does what most of you do all the time and what some of you will do during this message. He started talking. Jesus started talking. And so some of you, you know, we all just talk and talk and talk. We love to hear ourselves talk. And so that's what Jesus did. When anxiety rose up, Jesus talked back. He had something to say whenever he felt anxious. And so what I want to do is to look at how he wrestled with and how he overcame anxiety. And we'll look at three different places, three different things on how he talked to anxiety and how he, he talked to overcome anxiety. And this is all happening in Mark chapter 14. And so how do you find relief from anxiety? Well, the first thing that we see Jesus do and it's the thing that many of you may want to do if you're battling with this. And the first thing is to talk to your friends. Talk to your friends. That's what Jesus did. Whenever you're feeling overwhelmed, you're feeling anxious, you feel like you have a heaviness or a weight, it's really, really wise to talk to godly, spiritual, helpful friends. That's what Jesus did. And so to give you some context, Mark 14, this is taking place after the last suffer with his disciples, right? His closest friends, that's who they were. And Judas, one of the 12, had already slipped out to go and betray Jesus. And in that moment, you can only imagine the anxiety that, that set in as Jesus knew what was happening, right? It's starting now. Judas has left. He knows what's about to happen, and this anxiety just, just hits him. And so what Jesus did is he went with his, his three buddies to the Garden of Gethsemane to pray. And we pick up in verse 32 of Mark 14. It says this. It says, they went to a place called Gethsemane, which if you remember to a message in the past, it, it literally translates to the crushing. Right? And it says, and Jesus said to his disciples, sit here while I pray. He took Peter, James, and John along with him, and he began to be deeply distressed and troubled. Right? This is Jesus that we're talking about, the Son of of God, who was perfect and never ever sinned, was deeply distressed and troubled. And now if we look at a different translation, we're actually going to look and we're going to use the message. And now the message is much more of a, a devotional kind of translation, but it's got some good stuff in it. And so verse 33 in the message says this, it says, he plunged into a sinkhole of dreadful agony. There's a lot of big heavy words in that. He plunged into a sinkhole of dreadful agony. I wonder if any of us can relate, can just say that I've, I've been there. I've been in a place that felt like that. Right? That heart breaking of just feeling like you're sinking, right? Where your heart's just beating and you can't catch your breath. That sense of darkness and panic is just kind of surrounding you. And Jesus was there. It says he sank into this dreadful agony. And you would say, well, well, why did Jesus do that? Why would he allow that to happen? Jesus was God in the flesh, but yet he was also fully man. And he knew the horror of what was about to come. Even though he was completely innocent, he was going to be arrested. He was going to be tortured, right? Beaten beyond recognition of a man and die, death by crucifixion, the most painful and humiliating way to die. And even worse than all of that, Jesus was perfect. 
right? He didn't even deserve this that was coming. He was sinless, but yet he was about to then become sin as the sacrifice for sin. So if you can imagine, he never sinned. He's always been in perfect communication with his heavenly father, and now he's going to become sin. And we can even name that sin if you want, right? He was going to become abuse. He was going to become hatred and violence and racism and envy and lying and lust. And the list goes on and on and on. He was going to become that. Holiness was going to become filthiness. The one who never sinned was then going to become sin. And because of it, his father in heaven had to look away, right? It says he turned away because the holiness of God could not look upon sin. And in the middle of this, Jesus would cry out one of the most painful sufferings, right? My God, my God, right? Father, where are you? Why'd you turn away? Why have you forsaken me? And yet, on the tail of all this, in the middle of all that, that sinkhole of emotionalness, look at what Jesus said and just watch the honesty that Jesus has with his friends in the garden. Knowing all of this is coming, watch the honesty that he has with his friends. And I'm emphasizing that word honesty because I don't know if you've ever noticed, but nobody lies like Christians lie. We love to lie to each other. And that's just real talk. Because I can come up and ask you and be like, how are you doing? Oh, I'm good. I'm fine. You know, I'm still breathing. Like we're keeping on, keeping on, or whatever you say. Like, and that's a lie. Because a lot of the times we're not fine. We're not good. But watch Jesus with just raw, complete, transparent honesty with his friends. He looks at them and he says, guys, my soul is overwhelmed with sorrow to the point of death. In other words, I ache so much on the inside, I don't know if I can survive this. And he looked and he said to them, stay here and keep watch. He tells them how he's feeling. He didn't just say, I, I'm good. I'm fine. I'm still breathing. He tells them how he's feeling with complete honesty. He says, I need you. Stay here. Keep watch. He talked to his friends. And so if you're somebody that feels like you're, you're struggling with anxiety, I believe one of the biggest reasons is because you're, you're feeling anxious because you're lacking community. Because those friends that Jesus went and talked to, maybe you don't have people like that in your life. Maybe you don't have that community around you that you can go to and talk and be this honest. You always feel like you've got to have your guard up. If I'm fine, I'm good. I honestly believe it's because we are lacking community. There's so many people that you're feeling unsettled. You feel like you're scared to death. You're vulnerable to whatever the latest addiction is because you're lacking godly, encouraging, uplifting, spiritually building community from the body of Christ from the church and I gave you that stat earlier from 2020 right everybody knows what happened in 2020 with COVID right the quarantine the isolation think about what that did to the emotional psyche of a whole generation right because if you go all the way back to the beginning of the book right we're talking about the Bible the word of God in the very opening story God says it is not good for man to be alone it's not good to be isolated. It's not good to be disconnected because it's not good for people to be alone. We were not made to be alone. In fact, Jesus, who is the, the incarnation, right? He is God with us, Emmanuel. In other words, God didn't just shout his love from heaven, but he showed us his love on earth. He came to be with us because we weren't made to be alone. He came to be with us. Right? The power of being with is something special. Because that's what the body of Christ is for. That's why maybe, you know, if you miss a week of church or you miss a back-to-back, -back, like, and you come back, it can be so refreshing to just be back in church, back around the people that you love after a week or two. Because we miss being with. There's something about the presence of God and experiencing it with your friends, experiencing it with a family because you weren't created to be alone. 
It's a little bit like the difference between praying for somebody and praying with somebody. And maybe you've never even thought about it. Maybe you could, you know, just use them interchangeably. But let me tell you, they're very different. Now, I love when people pray for me, and I love to pray for you. But there's a difference when you pray for me and when we pray with each other. Because, I'll be honest with you, you can post something on Instagram, you can text something in the group, and you can text one of us and say, hey, pray for me. And I promise you, every time I see that, I'll do it. Every time one of these leaders sees it, we'll do it. We'll pray for you. If most of these students in this room see it, they'll do it. They'll pray for you. And you can know that, and that's special. But what's better than that is if you come to church, you see somebody face to face, and you can hold hands, you can put your arms around one another, and you don't just pray for me, and I pray for you, but we pray with each other because there's something about experiencing the presence of God with his people. And so Jesus, right, the sinless son of God, says to his friends, I need you. I need you. And he talks to, me, talks to him and says, this is, is crushing me. I don't know if I can make it through this. Will you just sit with me? Will you just pray with me? My soul is overwhelmed. Please just, just pray with me. And so if you're feeling anxiety, the first thing you can do is exactly what Jesus did. You can talk to godly people, to your friends. The second, that you can talk to your father, your heavenly father. Right? And let me explain this one to you this way. I don't know if it creates anxiety in you. Some of you that don't drive won't get this, but this creates anxiety in me. Whenever you're driving and you get that little red light that goes off in your car, right? You get the little exclamation point, which I found out means that your tires are low, or you get the, the check engine light. What does that light mean? It means something wrong, right? But what's wrong is not the light, right? The light isn't like, hey, I'm a problem. Right, you can't just cover up the light and fix the problem because I've tried that. I just like put a picture of the light and I was like, everything's fine. And then it wasn't. Um, and so what that light does is it's a signal telling you that there is something wrong and you would be wise to take your car to the shop. And so what is anxiety? Anxiety is a signal, right? It's that light saying, hey, it's an alert. Anxiety is a signal alerting you that it's time to pray. It's time to take what's on your mind to God because it's weighing on you harder than you thought. In fact, Paul said this. He told the Philippians, he said, do not be anxious about anything, but in everything, in every situation, take your request to God. In everything you pray, in every situation you pray. In other words, if it's big enough for you to worry about, it's big enough for you to pray about. It. What's on your mind, what's on your heart, you take it to God. If you're worried about people in your family, pray about it. If you're worried about school and grades and the expectations that come with it, pray about it. If you're worried about the standard that you feel like your parents have set for you, pray about it. If there's decisions in your life that you've got to make, pray about it. If you're worried about your future and all of that lying ahead, pray about it. Whatever it is, pray about it. Because if it's on your mind, it's on God's heart, and if it's big enough for you to worry about, it's big enough for you to pray about. So what is anxiety? It's a signal telling us that it's time to pray. So Jesus talked to his friends. He also talked to his heavenly Father, and we see it in verse 35. It says, it says going a little farther, he fell to the ground and prayed that if possible, the hour might pass from him. Abba, Father, he said, everything is possible for you. Take this cup from me. He says, please, if there's any other way, let's do it that way. Here's what I love about this prayer, though, because it, it was just honest. It wasn't memorized. It's just in the moment, honesty. Because I'll, I'll tell you, I think one of the bigger mistakes we make is teaching kids to pray, like memorized prayers, right? And the ones we teach them, like, bro, they're bad. Like, just straight up, like, the prayers we teach them are, are, are crazy. Like, one of the first prayers you ever learned, one of the first ones you probably ever prayed is, is terrifying. Right? Listen to this. Now I lay me down to sleep. I pray the Lord my soul to keep. If I should die before I wake, I pray the Lord my soul to take. Who came up with that? To teach a four-year-old that you might die tonight, and if you do, someone's going to take your soul. 
And you better ask for it to be God because it's